Hi, everyone. Uh, so this is going to be a brief overview of um, some of the uh, debate between uh, Foucault and Hadot to end our class on philosophy as a way of life. Um, so for the last few weeks, we've been um, reading uh, mostly from Foucault. Um, so he was a um, 20th century uh, French thinker, um, kind of hard to classify as um, a uh, philosopher only. He did a bunch of stuff. Um, but uh, towards the end of his life, um, he, he died in the 80s, 1980s, um, he became interested in um, the um, period of Greek and Roman philosophy that we've been studying in this class. Um, so it's what, as you know, he calls the care of the self, um, and we've been calling philosophy as a way of life um, throughout the semester. Um, so uh, Foucault was fascinated by um, the, uh, the Stoics, the Epicureans, uh, but various other figures um, who were uh, working in this tradition, um, and uh, especially some of the Roman writers that, that we've read. So folks like Seneca and, um, and uh, Marcus Aurelius and um, uh, people like that who uh, viewed philosophy uh, not just as a theoretical exercise, but as uh, something that could help us uh, live better lives. Um, so uh, there's a lot of um, things we could discuss with Foucault. He wrote and lectured a lot on this topic in the last uh, few years of his life. Um, but uh, the one that we're looking at is what's addressed by um, Hadot. So in the um, short reading on um, the uh, cultivation of the self in the Hadot book, uh, he criticizes Foucault for, he thinks, um, misinterpreting what um, the ancient Greek and Romans were up to when they were doing this kind of philosophy. Uh, so what Foucault calls care of the self. Um, so uh, the, um, the sort of um, crux of their disagreement comes down to uh, whether we should interpret um, the care of the self as sort of an aesthetic enterprise, uh, as Foucault does, or if we should take a more uh, traditional approach and um, kind of take these philosophers at their, at their word that they're not merely doing something aesthetic, but trying to understand uh, the objective nature of the universe and of the human being and figure out what's good for the human being as sort of an objective matter of fact. Um, so I'll explain the difference between those two things. Um, but to start with what I, I called the traditional uh, interpretation, uh, if you pick up the Stoics, um, you'll find that they have um, this entire uh, theory of the cosmos, right, the nature of the universe, uh, theory of human nature, and that seems to fit together all of that and kind of support their ideas of what uh, a good life is. So uh, remember, um, yeah. uh, so if you think back to the three branches of uh, Greek philosophy, we can divide it into um, logic, physics, and ethics. Um, so we've, in this class, mostly been focused on ethics, which is a broad category for them, not just about what's morally right, but also uh, what's good, uh, what counts as a good life. Uh, so that's been the main focus of the course. Um, but the Stoics' conception of what a good life is uh, seems to be based in part on um, their uh, commitments in what we can call physics, right? So they think that the universe somehow is a rational place, that somehow it's infused with some kind of rational principle that uh, governs the universe um, and that human nature is such that we too are rational and it's our job, right? Teleologically, we're sort of directed towards trying to uh, live up to uh, what we, we can be, what we ought to be, and that fits with what the universe is too. Um, so just as the universe is a rational place, ultimately, if, in the Stoics view, if you look at it the right way, um, so we too should be rational beings. Now that's what's in our nature, that's what's good for us. And because of that, on the sort of traditional interpretation and kind of the approach that Hado favors, um, because of that, uh, we should engage in the various spiritual exercises that the Stoics um, concocted. Uh, we should try and live up to their notion of what the good life is, uh, because all of it is justified and grounded by this conception of um, what is objectively good for us, not just what we like or what we want, but what's really good for us, uh, which in turn is grounded in the nature of the universe. Um, same thing goes for the Epicureans, right? So Epicurus has um, this theory of uh, the atomistic universe that he borrowed from other Greek philosophers. Uh, so the thought that the nature of the universe, right? So this is his physics, 
um, really is a place that's composed of these tiny particles. Right? Not everything that exists is material in nature. It's composed of these atoms. Uh, and that has all sorts of implications for his views about what death is and therefore how we ought to regard it. And so his sort of um, ethical stance on what the right way to view our death is, a uh, way that will be healthy for us, that will uh, allow us to flourish, seems to be based on his conception that, uh, well, death is just the end of one's existence because there's no um, immaterial soul that can survive death. Um, again, we're just, um, we're just collections of atoms. We decompose and that's it, right? So once you're dead, there's nothing to worry about because there's no you anymore. Um, and uh, similar things could be said for Epicurus on hedonism, right? That he really thinks uh, that objectively, the only good thing in life is pleasure. Not just that that's what he likes, but that for anyone, that's what the good life is. And if somebody disagrees with that, Epicurus thinks that they're mistaken and that they can be or should be persuaded by rational arguments to show that, no, hedonism is true. Um, so you can probably see the, the issue here, right? Um, one of the um, goals of our class has been to examine whether uh, philosophy as a way of life could have any um, use for us today. Um, so can we learn um, anything from Stoicism, Epicureanism, skepticism, cynicism, um, and maybe even uh, adopt one of those philosophies in some form as our own and try and live that way in, um, what, what are we, 21st century, whatever it is now, um, in the present day? Or is this stuff all just of historical interest and kind of dead to us? Maybe it's interesting to a few weird people that can learn about it, um, but it's not really going to help you live a good life. Um, so one way we could address that is just by trying it out. And that was um, something you did for the 72 hour experiment. You lived as a Stoic or an Epicurean and, or tried to, and that might've taught you something about whether this seems worth pursuing um, just as a start, of course. Um, but another way to approach it is from a theoretical point of view, sort to sort of ask, could we even accept um, the uh, sort of essential features of Stoicism or Epicureanism today or are these just weird theories that, uh, again, are kind of dead to us and of no use? Um, so Foucault was kind of worried about that. Um, so if you don't agree with the Stoics, right, if you think that they were wrong when they said the universe was a rational place, then is it really possible to live as a Stoic? Um, you know, by analogy, if um, you, know, you might be familiar with this in a religious context, right? So you might say, well, if I reject the basic central uh, doctrines of some religion, can I really say um, to be, uh, can I really treat myself as a practitioner of that religion? Right? So maybe I go to church or something, but I don't believe in any of the stuff. So, well, am I really, am I really a member of this religion or am I just, you know, kind of faking it? What, what's, what's the point of me going um, to these, um, to these uh, events and these rituals and so on? If I don't really believe in this stuff. Um, same thing with Stoicism. If I don't believe that the universe is a rational place, how could I be a Stoic? Um, or for Epicureanism, if I just don't think atomism is true, or if I don't think hedonism is true, then is it really possible for me to be a, a practicing Epicurean? Um, and it seems like the uh, philosophers back in the day who presented these theories would probably say, well, no, of course not. Being a Stoic involves accepting the uh, Stoic philosophy. And it wouldn't really make too much sense to try and live as a Stoic unless you actually believed that what they said was true and good. Um, so that might all seem pretty obvious, and just common sense. Um, but again, we get back to the issue. Well, for us today, there are people who look at Stoicism, for example, and find it uh, valuable that they think, yeah, living according to this um, is really helpful to them. Um, uh, so some people find that. Uh, but if they have to go back and believe uh, the Stoic philosophy in, um, say, all their theories in physics, for example, and theories of human nature, that might be kind of hard to do, right? Uh, because it, it might be hard to sort of fit. Um, you know, maybe some people can do it, but for many of us, it might be hard to uh, really accept some of their more grandiose ideas um, in the modern day. And if that's the case, then it would be kind of a shame if, well, stoicism would be useful, right? I really like the mode of life it suggests, it seems to work for me, 
but I can't do it because I don't believe the universe is really rational after all. I think it's empty and meaningless or something. Um, so, you know, maybe that's just the way it is. And it's like, yeah, this would have been nice, but I can't, can't believe in it. So I have to look for something else. But Foucault didn't think that was um, really um, necessary. So Foucault thought, despite what um, these ancient philosophers themselves said and the way they presented their theories and their arguments, he thought what was really going on um, was uh, something different. Uh, so especially in the interview you read on the uh, genealogy of ethics, where he gets asked some questions about um, this work in progress that uh, he's engaged in at the time, most of which didn't end up uh, being finished or published because uh, he died. Um, but uh, some of the questions he's asked, um, he's pretty clear that he thinks that, no, what the Greeks and the Romans were up to and what we nowadays could be up to if we want is uh, uh, primarily an aesthetic exercise. So um, aesthetic um, comes from the Greek word stasis, which means um, sensation or something like that. Um, but for us, it's associated with uh, beauty. So we say something, you know, an aesthetic experience is, um, or a, a positive one is an experience of beauty. Um, and uh, Foucault uses this term, uh, an aesthetics of existence, which is kind of an odd term. Um, but by that, he just means that people who pursue what he calls an aesthetics of existence are trying to give um, some kind of beauty to their own lives. Right? So they're um, almost treating their, their life as a work of art. And uh, they're trying to make that, uh, their life um, more interesting, more intense, more beautiful. And he thinks that's what the Stoics were doing. That's what the Epicureans were doing. Even the skeptics and the cynics and um, other schools of philosophy. Um, that what they were really doing, although they had to present it as, you know, look, we've discovered the true nature of the human being and of the universe and so on. It's like, yeah, that, that's not really the important thing in his view. Uh, the important thing, what was really driving them was this uh, desire to find some kind of meaning and purpose in life. And really it was just one that they invented for themselves. Right? So just like you make a work of art, you create it, you don't discover it, right? If you're an artist, you don't go dig art out of the earth, you uh, make it. Um, so uh, Foucault thought uh, our lives can be like that too. And he thought that was you know, kind of neat and interesting and uh, maybe worth pursuing. Um, so if you take that approach, if you uh, view philosophy as a way of life, as an aesthetics of existence, right? Uh, then it seems like, well, yeah, I don't really need to buy into what the Stoics said about the nature of the universe in order to practice Stoicism. I can just adopt their practices, the spiritual exercises that they engaged in, um, and I can just reject the idea that the universe is a rational place. Maybe I don't really believe that, but I find the Stoic way of life beautiful, and I want to adopt that for myself. Um, notice if you take this approach, though, um, you can't really, at least on Foucault's view, justify that to others. Right? You can't say, okay, this aesthetics of existence is the right way to live, and everyone ought to follow it, because um, on Foucault's interpretation, if it's all aesthetic, you're kind of giving up on that, right? You're not saying this is the objective truth. Rather, you're saying this is something I find beautiful and worth pursuing. I'm going to do this. You know, maybe other people want to as well, but if not, you know, I don't have any argument for why they should. I'm not going to try and convince them because there's really nothing to convince them of. It's just, I like this way of life. This is what I'm going to do. Um, so Foucault thinks that's what's really going on um, with the... Uh, Stoics and the Epicureans and the others, that uh, what you have here are um, uh, people who were um, unsatisfied uh, for one reason or another with um, what, their, um, what their cultural options were outside of philosophy, right? That there was something about you know, maybe the religion of their day or um, other, um, other modes of life within their society that they just didn't find attractive or not as, not as attractive as what the uh, philosophers were offering. There was something more um, beautiful about, um, say, Epicurus's philosophy. Uh, so imagine you're a person who's just disgusted by uh, consumerism um, or uh, all these expectations about you know, what you're supposed to do within a society. Yet maybe it all just seems like nonsense and a waste of time to you. You might find Epicurus's uh, simplistic way of life um, very refreshing, right? And you might think, but well, yeah, that's 
that's worth doing. There's something, there's something good about that. There's something that I like about that, and uh, I should, maybe you try to adopt it or borrow parts of it at least. Um, and um, for Foucault, that's that's kind of just that's what it is. Right? And um, spiritual exercises like writing, for example, um, in his article Self Writing, he talks about um, the uh, um, the Stoic practices of uh, number one, keeping a journal, um, and number two, writing correspondence to to others, letters back and forth. Um, and it's um, it's not that this is the one way of life that you ought to pursue because uh, it's the right way, but rather it's just a way that some people have found, um, yeah, this helps me organize my thoughts. It helps me try and be a more rational person. That's something I find worth doing. If other people don't find it worth doing, then, you know, that's just... All right, that's fine. And uh, you know, maybe there's there's no reason they should be interested in the same things I am. Um, so Foucault's approach probably sounds uh, attractive to a lot of people. Um, so in my experience, I find uh, um, uh, a lot of people in um, who study philosophy, right? A lot of students are not um, don't find plausible the idea that there's some objective truth, especially about what makes life worth living. And uh, if, if you think that there isn't, and if you think that there is no objective right answer to what a good life is, or if you think that maybe there is an answer, but we have no way of knowing it, um, then Foucault's approach might, might be attractive. You might think, yeah, that's the best we can do, right? We need to make decisions about how to live. You might as well choose to do it in a way that's meaningful to you. Um, so maybe Foucault is right. Um, uh, there's really two claims he's making. Um, number one, that this sort of aesthetics of existence is um, the way we should go about uh, the care of the self or philosophy as a way of life um, today for ourselves. And maybe he's right about that, maybe he isn't. But then there's also the second claim that this is what the uh, philosophers of ancient times were really doing themselves, even though it doesn't really look like it on the surface. Right? If you read the surface, it looks like Epicurus says, my physical theories are true, and because of that, it suggests all these ethical ideas about what a good life is, and this is objectively right, and everyone should do it. Um, Foucault is saying controversially that, nah, that's not really what uh, was going on. Yeah, that's what they said, but um, that's just kind of window dressing. It wasn't really uh, the important thing. It wasn't what was really driving them. Um, it, maybe he's right about that. Maybe he's wrong. Like I said, it's a more controversial claim. Uh, most people who study Ancient philosophy, uh, I would say, do not agree with that. Um, doesn't mean he's wrong, but uh, just be aware it's a controversial claim. And Hadot is one of the people who would disagree with Foucault. So he thinks Foucault basically just completely misinterprets uh, the ancient philosophers. So to say that the Stoics and the Epicureans were just pursuing an aesthetics of existence, um, Hadot thinks that that's just wrong. That's not what they were doing. Um, he thinks... And again, this is from the short passage near the end of the Philosophy is a Way of Life book, or the short chapter uh, in which he criticizes Foucault. Um, Hadot argues that, no, the Stoics really believed in what they were saying, and Epicurus really believed in what he was saying. And same goes for the skeptics and the other schools of philosophy. And if you think that, then we're back to um, the original, um, one of the earlier problems I mentioned, which is if you don't accept the theoretical underpinnings of Stoicism, for example, then can I really live um, according to the spiritual exercises and the conception of the good life that uh, they offer? And uh, you know, if Hadot's right, then maybe maybe not. It's hard to see um, how it would work. With Foucault, it's a bit easier because I just say, yeah, I just ditch the parts I don't like, and you know, I have something left, the Stoic way of life, and I find that beautiful, so I'm just going to do it. Um, but for Hadot, if you take that route, you're not really um, uh, engaging with the Stoics in a, uh, in a way that would make sense from their point of view. I mean, you could still do it, of course, but you can't be claiming, in Hadot's view, uh, to be understanding what the Stoics themselves thought they were doing. And again, we have this distinction I mentioned between um, how we choose to live today, right, uh, versus how we should interpret what the Stoics or the Epicureans themselves were doing. Right? Those are two different, two different things, right? 
not unrelated, but there's a distinction. Um, so Hedo kind of understands why uh, Foucault uh, would be tempted to misinterpret, in his view, um, the ancient philosophers. And uh, as he says in the reading, Hedo, uh, he thinks that um, Foucault was more interested in um, sort of fashioning uh, an aesthetics of existence, right? A form of the care of the self uh, for us today, right? for him in the 20th century, but um, for the next one now, I guess. Um, and uh, so Hedo said, right, well, if that's your goal, you see why you kind of downplay all of the sort of um, weird theories that made sense to the ancient philosophers, right? And they weren't they weren't stupid, right? There were good reasons why they had these theories, but it might be kind of hard to fit um, some of this stuff into a, a modern view of the world, say with uh, modern physics and so on. Um, so uh, Hadot says, yeah, I understand that, you know, the temptation, right? There's something really exciting and interesting about um, the ways of life um, offered by ancient philosophy. Um, but, that doesn't mean that we can just so easily disconnect them from the uh, maybe to us implausible theories that um, were associated with them. And if that's the case, then, you know, it's not so clear. I can just pick and choose what I like from uh, the Stoic philosophy. Maybe you can, but it's just less obvious that it would work um, than if you take Foucault's approach. Um, so, um, so, so that kind of leaves us uh, with the question. Um, I'd like to end up the course on on this debate, and uh, I don't know what the right answer is, so I can't tell you. Um, but it's it's something for us, you know, to think about. Um, how, if at all, can we today benefit and learn from um, ancient forms of philosophy? Um, philosophy is a way of life. Is it of any use to us today? And if so, in in what way? Right? How could we adopt it? Should we take an approach like Foucault's, or should we stick with the more traditional approach of Hadot and um, try and find, maybe create a new philosophy, right? Or look for something more modern that um, kind of might be acceptable to us in terms of what it says about human nature and about the nature of the universe. Maybe try and use that to uh, fashion some conception of the good life and then spiritual exercises that help us live according to that. Uh, but starting from scratch is probably, you know, uh, a pretty um, pretty difficult task, right? That wouldn't be so easy to do. Um, so just something um, to think about um, at the conclusion of this class. Um, this was, uh, yeah, just a brief overview of the last few weeks of readings that I wanted to give you guys. Um, hope everyone's doing well, and uh, talk to you later. Bye.